welcome to Blind Shuffle, an arts and music podcast. Today we have a wild one. Brad Hock, have some bread, have some butter, with this wonderful animator and ceramicist. Enjoy. Pasta? Um, no, just stirring some coffee. What do you got? You got a mic in, or a, is this all natural? Uh, I got a headset mic in. Does it sound shit? No, sounds great. Okay, good. I just bought mm-hmm. these, though. So I don't know how well they work. No, I appreciate you going out of the way to buy that for this interview. <laughs> yeah, I think I'm. <laughs> you know, you, you you didn't, did you? Uh, no, I didn't. Uh, <laughs> I bought them for uh, work because my last set got smashed. But um, you work? Yeah. I do. I work at a pottery studio. Oh, that's that's how you've been sneaking these ceramics in the back yeah. door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Getting uh, as much free service as I can while I'm there. Is that a new thing for you? Uh, yeah. Ceramics is, I never touched it until I started working there. And, um, that was kind of my inspiration, I guess you could say to getting the job is being able to learn a little bit about that medium without having to pay someone to teach me. Nice. And you sell those or you're just doing it for the love of the game? Um, I haven't sold any of those pieces yet. I just kind of want to get to a place with the medium where I have like a a decent body of work that I can put out at the same start doing that. Nice. So how do you make money? I don't remember how you make money in general. Like, you know, from, I know you were a a high school football standout. So after that, um, I kind of went off the rails for a bit. Um, which rails? Just life rails. Um, <clears throat> so a large part of the reason I quit playing football was because my dad died when I was 18. Um, and after that, I didn't really have to continue doing that to earn a scholarship and to get an education. And um, I decided to go to junior college uh, and start learning how to do uh, video game design at the time, which slowly turned into me realizing I don't really like making video games, but I like stories. Mm. Um, So then I moved into animation from there um, and film. And yeah, I was uh, basically living a very shady life at the time. Um, (laughs) uh, Involved in a lot of illegal activities and it got to a point where it was starting to get a little scary. So I moved away to California. Um, And that's why I'm here. Wow. You're very open about that. Um, I mean, it's just, I guess, part of the story. I don't know. Um, Wait, where were you doing the shady things? I don't remember where you're originally from. um, This is when I I grew up in Chicago. Um, Oh, yeah. And, uh, yeah, I was just, that was kind of what was normal to me. Um, I got arrested at a really young age for possession. Um, and I basically could not get a job for like, literally I couldn't get a job at McDonald's in Chicago. So, and so, so animation was the next logical step. Uh, well, uh, originally the first logical step was to work for usually a security or doing some type of um 
I guess you would call it bodyguard work. If that sounds weird, but um, henchman. Yeah, I, I would get paid to drive things and to watch things and to um, <laughs> run a store that had a 24 hour thing. Um, I started doing that and that's kind of where everything spun off the rails. And I realized I was getting into something that was a little bit deeper than I ever wanted to. And at the time I was like, oh, this is cool. It's writing experience. I'm young. Um I love this. This like I see crazy shit every day. And then after a while, you kind of start to realize like, oh, this isn't really worth the writing experience. I'm being psychologically damaged. So oh, sure. well. um <laughs> Yeah, I like I like that. A henchman who's like, oh, this is good writing, uh, you know, fodder. I really like this. That's pretty unique. But that speaks <laughs> that speaks to your um what I would call your complicated personality. Like, uh, it's pretty rare that it seems like you have two very clear chapters, at least, right? The football focused part. And then the, and then I don't think you, you give a shit about football anymore, right? No, I don't watch football or. You don't look like a henchman either anymore. I don't know if you did. No, no. Um, I mean, occasionally I will, when I'm looking for odd jobs, I'll pick up, like security or doorman gigs. Cause usually I can just fit the role if I need to. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, I don't have a guard card or anything anymore, so I can't really do it, uh, it legally anymore unless I go through that whole process. And in Los Angeles, it's honestly not worth it. I think you have to wait like three years to get a guard card in this city. So you gotta, you gotta have the guard card. Yeah, it's it's a troll tool. Yeah, exactly. So so they don't get sued <laughs> if you get attacked while you're working or something. Or oh, I don't know how it works. So before that uh, transition period, did you think you were going to be an artist, or you were really uh, you were really into the football trajectory, or how does that look? Um, so I I played football because my whole life I was basically told you're an athlete of the family. You can get a scholarship doing this. Um, so this is what you're going to do. And this is how our family is going to be able to pay for your brothers and sisters educations because we won't have to pay for yours and it will make it easier for everyone. So I had th two brothers and a sister, a uh, pretty full house and we were never really, uh, well to do. My dad was a drywall and painting guy. Um, and ran the company he worked for, but still, and my mom's a nurse. So we weren't like poor, but um, yeah, that was kind of always how it was put to me. So I was, I was raised in a kind of weird, like warrior type way, I guess you would say. <laughs> sure. Very from how I am now, but. Well, I'm sure that stays with you somehow. I guess in certain situations, yeah, it comes out and I prefer it not to honestly, but, um, yeah. Boy, that's a ton of responsibility early on there. So, but were you making, were you secretly drawing? Were yeah. you like, you, you were a secret artist inside of a big giant man? Basically. Yeah. It was, it's kind of funny. I didn't realize that I was keeping it secret until I was like a junior in high school and I had some friends gather around me while we were at a bowling alley and I was drawing on a napkin and they had thought that I had picked up someone else's napkin that had a drawing on it. And they were like, what the hell is this? And I was just like, Oh, I'm just doing a doodle. And they didn't believe me. So I did another one. And then they were like, kind of all like, okay, that's weird. Um, yeah. So, uh, and then I, I put, put it together actually and realized that I had been keeping it secret for a very long time um, and unconsciously and hadn't realized it. But I think it went back to uh, my younger days of getting in trouble, drawing pictures of my teachers um, and like insulting them and them finding them. And I, Oh, like, okay. Yeah. I just like started hiding it, I guess. So it's not related to some like macho ideal where you thought drawing was some kind of betrayal of that warrior spirit. 
Oh, no, not at all. I, I always loved it. And then like once people found out about it, I was like, oh, this is cool. And um, I started like designing T-shirts for friends and things like that. And for this high school that I went to, like their sports programs and things. So. And it actually, it, it strangely changed a lot of people's perspectives of me, because before that, I was just like um, not human to most people. I was like this kind of. uh meathead dipshit and um the hawk yeah they were like oh he can draw and then all my coaches started treating me differently and they were like oh like so you're an intellectual and i was that's why you're not good at doing what we tell you to do and i was like no that's not really it um <laughs> yeah 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 you know i was like i just like drawing um so yeah um I, I to, oh sorry go ahead well, I recall you telling me that you were the hawk. You were the prophesized, you were the penultimate hawk. Do you think that you're fulfilling that prophecy in some other fashion? <laughs> I don't know. It's a, something my dad used to say to me that like his dad, I guess, said to him that there was some like <laughs> ancestor of ours that was supposed to come up and be like reborn again or something. I, I really don't know where he got it. I imagine it was... Maybe oh, something he made up because um, he was a, like we didn't really know this about my dad until after he passed away. But um, he was like one of these people that was really high IQ for what he did. And his dad died when he was young and it kind of took his life off the rails. And um, him and his brother ended up living together while he was still in high school and his mom like kind of just bailed on them and moved in with some other guy and moved to like three states away. So yeah, I don't know. I, I imagine maybe it had something to do with him keeping himself together and kind of uh, justifying his life path in some way. I, I don't really know. Interesting. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's like you're, um, you're doused in mythology when you're raised in a way like that, you know? I mean, it goes even fucking crazy further. Um, if you really want to get into my, school. well, I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> that's, 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 I find it fascinating, but I, that's for you to tell, you know, I, I'll listen. The world uh, will listen. I mean, so this is something I have talked about in public before, but I don't talk about public, uh, in public very often because it's kind of difficult to talk about, but, um, I actually have been trying to be more open about it, especially in regards to my creative career, because it really is kind of the thing that changed my life completely, um, which is my dad died on my 18th birthday. Uh, and it wasn't a coincidence. He took his own life. So that kind of was like, holy shit. Uh, and really took all that stuff into just like a crazy different trajectory and made me like for a while, I think there were a few years afterwards where I did kind of go slightly crazy and had this idea of like, I'm on this path to like live this, you know, hero's journey and do all this stuff. And if I'm being completely honest, those echoes still definitely ring in my head at some points, but I try to kind of um, not see reality that way. <laughs> but, uh, well, I mean, I think the hero's journey is useful, you know, in in a lot of ways. But yeah, I've never lived through that. That's that's wild. I don't. It's almost like an attempt at like soul transferring or something. There's something very weird about the number. Like you're turning eighteen, so you're kind of like an adult. I just don't. Do you think there's like relevance to his decision and you becoming eighteen? I really don't know. Um... It's it, the whole thing was so confusing because my dad, I, I mean, like I grew up in Chicago. A lot of my friends were heroin addicts growing up. I, I was in a rough crowd, even though I was the football player. I was like yeah. the football player that hung out with all my old druggy friends that weren't playing football anymore. Um, and whenever like one of those kids would try to do something or like have an incident where, you know, he he always like would shit on it and be like, oh, suicides for like weak people. Huh. And he'd say, you don't try to commit suicide. You either do or you don't. 
Uh, and if you really want to commit suicide, you make sure it gets done the right way. And I always kind of was like, huh, that's weird. Like, uh, what, he's, he's thought about this a lot, but I never really thought about it in that way. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it kind of like started to make sense more down the road. But I mean, according to the autopsies, they said that he was not in his right state of mind when it happened. Um, apparently had a bunch of stuff in his system and uh, was undergoing what they call psychosis. But psychosis is just a bullshit term psychologists put on things when they don't understand what's going on. Yeah. Like mental breakdown. Like, oh, well, let's just, this person did something that a functional member of the state doesn't do. So let's just call it psychosis. And then we can all write this off as just uh, a glitch. Yeah. I mean, I almost like, I see more like, I'm kind of into the idea of possession, demonic or otherwise, or good possession, you know? So like, I don't think of things mostly from that psychological framework, but that is fucking wild. Um, yeah. When you say possession, do you mean like more so in a sense of a physical relationship to possession by the individual or possession as in like um, spirit possession or uh... spirit, spirit, because it seems really evident to me that, um, like, I actually believe there's almost spirits at war above this realm. And, <laughs> and like, like, as weird as it sounds, I, I think that when people become obsessive with, about, like, political tides, they're missing that there's these, like, bigger wars being fought way above. And that's, I'm more concerned with that, you know, like the spiritual warfare at play. But, you know, the way I think about it is when you make art, it feels a lot more like a possession than than a conscious production of something. When you make good art, I think bad art is, is kind of just like just psychology or just propaganda. Maybe. Oh, you're me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, like, you know, through making art, it used to happen to me a lot more. But now I kind of make more like design and more conscious stuff that's like has a purpose. But before when I made much weirder comics and let like a spirit run through me. Um, yeah, it just felt to me like possession was a more accurate description. But I think it does, that happens to people far beyond art. Like I think most people are, are, if not all people are possessed, it just depends who they're letting through the door. If they, totally. Yeah, even if they, some people don't have control of the door. The door is just busted open, and whatever creature, demon, angel want to walk, they want to walk through. They walk through, you know. Yeah, it kind of reminds me of. Um, I think it's Deleuze, or yeah, Deleuze's um, micro rhizome kind of ideas, but this this concept that we're we're actually part of a larger organism. And like our political divides, our likes and dislikes are actually signals kind of being sent to us through maybe a, a, some type of fungal neural network, or it could be more Jungian where it is like an actual spirit or archetype. But, um, you know, that there's these kind of this idea that we're fighting wars that we're not even aware of and we're having guttural instincts to things that are really actually being driven more by our gut bacteria sending signals to our brain than our brain making those signals on their own. Um, which, That's interesting. I don't know how that connects to art. I think maybe art, it could be an entirely different thing, but um, I mean, I definitely would say when I made old boys apples, there was a hundred percent. I was possessed by something and the moment it was finished, it left me and I was devastated. <laughs> oh, yeah. God. Yeah. Uh, it took me like three months of just not being able to do anything creative or like having no energy at all really to recover and then finally start finding something to be interested in again. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that is a Jungian concept largely that like the, the idea has the person and the person doesn't have the idea and it'll do anything to get out and it'll use the person to manifest you know, when necessary. Um, 
I think in a capitalist and materialist society, that's hard to comprehend for people who haven't felt that or made things sometimes. Um, it's also scary, you know, like um, it's quite frightening <laughs> in some sense. Yeah. It feels more akin to a, a more like mythological or archaic perspective where we're under the influence of these other things that are more powerful than us. Whereas I think our modern, at least in the West, our perspective is that like we're in control and we have psychology to explain the sane and the insane. And when all of a sudden, I don't know, who knows what kind of discoveries we're going to make in the future. But when they start telling people, you know, you were possessed by something and that's why you did this, I don't think it's going to make a lot of people comfortable. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, there's... Like the gut biome idea is cool if I understand it correctly, but it's also a little boring to me um, outside of the scale difference. Like there's kind of something nice about the scale where it's like little tiny things controlling bigger things. Um, whereas I'm talking about bigger things controlling little things, but I guess it, the it, well, it, yeah. in a way I, it actually is that it's just, more, I, I mean, it is a bit reductionist in a sense yeah. that it's, it's explaining it through science. But the idea is that it's, it's like um, mycorrhizal or uh, mycofungal kind of can communicate in a way where they actually are technically a collective organism. Um, and human beings might actually be doing that too. And we're just not aware of it. Like something else could be studying us right now and being like, look at all this shit they're doing. And they think that they're coming up with this on their own. In reality, it's the cheese they're eating that is controlling, their, you know, this bacteria and the cheese. That right. Or ergot kind of logic. Yeah. 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 And, it, yeah. and that could be a spirit, you know, that could, I, I kind of am very much um, an, an animist in the sense that I don't believe that objects are objects i think that there is life that exists in everything and i i don't believe that just from a spiritual standpoint i believe it from a scientific standpoint too because you can actually look into anything with a microscope and find out that there are things living inside of it that are sending signals out to other things um yeah 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 i mean it's yeah there's also, I don't know if you've ever read this Rudolf Steiner stuff, but he, he uh, oh yeah, there's stuff about, I think the term is food stuffs where he's talking about like vegetables, like they're living. And when you like cut them, they're like emitting pain or something in this very literal way. But uh, old yeah. boys, old boys, apples reminds, reminded me of that kind of feeling quite a bit. I mean, I, uh, the, the anthroposophical society in general, I think, had a huge influence on that work because uh, my partner at the time, who I was with for eight years, Sammy Graff, who helped write it, she grew up in the Waldorf uh, uh. program. So uh, I was introduced to their way of life while I was making that film. And uh, to be honest, I don't think I ever would have made that film or come up with any of those ideas had I not had those interactions with her um it's just simply something i wouldn't have done before yeah i mean i often have this issue where i really like the originator of ideas and then i show up to its current manifestation to meet the people who are into it and uh i don't know if you've had a different experience but i could not click with the waldorf steiner people i've encountered um <laughs> there's there's a, a an array i'll say that um sure there must some be that are like basically you realize they're like geniuses and they found this community that allows them to exist in this way that is comfortable for them and you're like oh i get it like this works for you and yeah. then there's other people who kind of exist on the periphery of it or in some ways I think kind of abuse it um, to, uh, I don't know. It, it, you, you just, you meet, it's like with any community, like when you go to a, a church or um, even just like, uh, a, I don't know, like um, a support group, there's kind of like people that are there for their own reasons. And there's people that are there to help 
the group. And then there's people who are just there. Yeah, know, it's true. It's there. true. <laughs> um, I might just be too much of a an asshole in some ways in terms of just like judging that too quickly or judging it too harshly. Um, but I do my best to get over that in some ways, so, you know, kind of rid yourself of that high schoolish um, bad faith, maybe. But <laughs> but I do find that like when you have immense thinkers like Young or Steiner, everyone's seeing really, really different stuff in their work. And so you might come in with an expectation. Like I took a class in, um, I don't, is it called? It's like some kind of drawing projection where you like keep following these lines and finding these geometries that emerge. Mm. But the way it was taught was so strangely patronizing to me. Um, <laughs> that it ruined it. Yeah. I don't know. Sometimes it's like this hippie-ish thing that creeps into alternative lifestyles that totally. I can't, can't quite digest. Even yeah, though a, like... yeah. It's a common problem, honestly, um, in this community and in other communities. Like, I we even people who are like tolerant of it, you get into it, and sometimes you're just like, "Oh my god!" Like, I can't listen to this person talk for another fifteen minutes. Um, yeah, there's like a of, like self indulgence and self insuredness. Like, I, I have a hard time with anybody who's like a hundred percent sure of their way. Um, Sure. Unless they're deeply fascinating. Like when you read Steiner's shit, you're like, what is he like? How does he know? Or how is he so confidently stating such absurdly precise yet uh, strange things, you know? Yeah. Like I would love to talk to that man because there was a time where I feel like you could just spew out absolutely wild shit and... There was no one there to, I'm not saying he was wrong, but there was no one there to kind of check you like internet wise or like fact checkers all around you. So you could, you could flow into these weird places without these breaks all around you. And, uh, I think people are almost afraid of going there to be reduced or judged by like guy with phone or guy with laptop who's going to look up the thing. You know what I mean? Totally. I mean, and there's a lot of people I think that would have been taken more seriously in the past that are now oftentimes reduced today because uh, we get this little window into their personal world that wasn't existent before. You know, when you went to see people talk or you read something, you only had a handful of images of collecting what this person looks like who they are and oftentimes that's the polished version they're trying to show you and nowadays uh most people are constantly inviting people into their personal surroundings with their phone or there's really just a low format low effort kind of techniques and i think sometimes there's a lot of brilliant people out there uh that unfortunately are gonna get lost in this uh chaotic media environment and their message may never be heard simply because they're just able to present it with too much ease and they're not really giving it the kind of polish that it needs to work um Mm, yeah that's an interesting way to put it yeah. yeah it's funny to take certain thinkers and drop them into now and just imagine how little mystique they'd have and if they'd be if they'd be like running a Patreon or <laughs> it's part of the, you know, self mythologizing is very interesting to me. And it's kind of an essential act in some ways. But, you know, as you spoke to earlier, there's clearly some dangers present there as well. I just don't know. the I don't know the alternative. You know, yeah, it's a, and, and I will say. I, I I try to keep myself in check with it, but when I'm being a hundred percent honest and like I'm in a dangerous situation or something happens and I'm having to rely on just reaction and living, I go there uh, immediately. There's no question about it. That's where my mind has learned to make myself comfortable is in this space of being like, rationalizing things through a mythological lens and then trying to figure out 
uh, sense in the situation. You know, that's it's, it's a, yeah. I've never thought of rationalizing via mythology. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a it's a way of being like, okay, this is a state of uh, I'm going through an initiatory or an attenuative process right now, and so that's why, even though I just got to this point where I thought I was getting comfortable, I thought I had life figured out, things were going to be a little easier. I turn the page, and oh, holy shit, there's another one. And I think there's this kind of idea in our society that you get to a point and then that goes away. But in reality, it never does. There's always going to be something difficult around the corner. um, And your death is going to be the last thing (laughs) that is difficult. And if you're lucky, you don't see it coming. But, uh, (laughs) you know. Well, yeah, we're, we're given the... You know, we've we've been given the false illusion that we control our environment and our reality. And there's a lot of evidence to suggest that we certainly have much more influence on it than, say, like a monkey or something. But it's kind of a trick because in the end, I certainly believe in the individual will and the desire to execute certain things specifically in life. But that can all be interrupted at any moment via, I don't know what you would call it, but I wouldn't call it chaos because I don't like the, that view of certain things. Uh, you know, there's something far more horrifying of viewing a natural disaster as something intentional from a spirit or a God than just c- calling it some fluke that rolled up and will roll up once in a while. I mean, I oftentimes like to flip this perspective on its head and wonder if maybe human beings have it entirely wrong. And that's kind of the, 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 uh, our way of evolving in this environment. And so we're, we're put in a situation where we're made to believe that we're in control, that we're the top, we're the apex predator. And then we're, given this life and and maybe something is saying, well, let's see what you do if you're given that power, if you're given this ideology. And maybe all of nature is actually these super, superior godlike beings to us because guess what? They can live on this planet without technology. They can survive and they have been doing so and evolving. And humanity might be heading to a place very soon where we're no longer a part of that because of our own idea of thinking that we can just fix problems as opposed to integrating ourselves into the situation that exists. And so sometimes I wonder, yeah. you know, maybe nature's laughing at us as we're going around thinking that we're, we're in control. Um, and that's kind of like maybe some weird test. I don't know. Obviously this gets into like a spiritual kind of ideas, but we're already there. So why not? Yeah. Our own ideas, the thing I, take some umbrage with because I don't think we have any idea where we're going, but I do think there's a clear directionality and intention to it, but I just don't think it's ours. So even with AI, which I kind of hate talking about, but it seems completely necessary. um, You know, there's some weird trajectory that we're heading towards. And it's so interesting how dedicated we can be to these things just like we can be dedicated to an art project without any real sense of where it's going i think all of humanity has that bend to it where it's just like full steam ahead no clue where we're going but there's kind of an optimism and speed to it that i find interesting yeah i mean there's the whole uh what what do they call it the uh human technological movement where we're fusing with technology. I can't remember. There's this yeah, transhumanism. Yeah. Transhumanism. And I, I always bring this up to people when they bring up transhumanism is like, it's this idea. And I'm like, uh, what the fuck do you think you are in transhumanism? Do you, you think that by joining a collective organism, you're somehow going to be happy and make decisions? <laughs> it's like, what, is, how does the collective organism work for you now? Are you making decisions? Are you doing things? No. There's someone else making decisions that you never see their face unless it's shown to you on a screen and they're telling you what to do or how to think. So 
what makes people think they're going to be anything other than CPU for some hive mind that's controlled by most likely another asshole? Because that's um, kind yeah. of how it goes. Um, Just some bureaucrat. It's like hyper uh, bureaucracy nightmare in my eyes. But yeah. we're going, we're so dooming and glooming right now. Let's shift gears and talk about <laughs> yeah, uh, I mean, it's, demons. It's <laughs> yeah. <laughs> No, I mean, what what you and I share in terms of depictions, and you certainly lived a more traumatic life than I had, is the love of masks and demons. Um, and it's just it's interesting to think, you know, I was raised Roman Catholic, so there's a lot of hell imagery to play off of. Um, <laughs> and I certainly mind it when I was at night just laying in bed alone. But um, it is interesting to consider why we drift towards that that representation you know masks of of course they're pretty fucking obvious metaphor but old boys apples this dude if i recall i watched it a couple months back there's something his thighs are soft it's kind of gentle being i don't recall him being so evil no he's not really um and there was a concept behind him originally that explains that because originally uh, it was a pitch for a series that mm. I wanted to develop where it's about um, basically the, the devil is a human being that survives the apocalypse, um, like a, a very powerful human being, um, but his kind of curse of surviving it is that he has to continue living um, over and over again. And him and this rat, this rat's also part of it. Cause uh, basically I'll, I'll just tell you what it was. He, he was a scientist and uh, him and his wife figured out a way to live forever. And this rat was the first one they did it to. And then he did it to himself and then his wife did it to herself, but in a different way. And, mm -hmm. um, over time, he turns into the devil. He like grows the red hair and he grows the horns uh, as like a mutation from living through this reality. And he uh, he has these rituals that he performs to basically keep the magic going, to keep reality going. And so he's like a clock keeper in a way. But over time, he starts to forget who he is and what he is. And um, by the end of it, he just wants to garden. And like meet his neighbors and drink tea, because uh, I think that's ultimately what happens when you lose your mind. <laughs> that's what happens, huh? Yeah. Well, you just—I mean, when you, when you go off the deep end and then you come back, you realize, like, you know what? I think I took some things for granted that I'd I'd like to enjoy doing a little more now. Yeah, hum humanity, humane aspects of the psyche. Yeah. You can get too far out. Exactly. Sometimes you, you try to do something that is difficult to, or seems inachievable or impossible, and you kind of lose yourself in the process of making it. And then you you ruin your own life and the people's lives around you temporarily or potentially while that's happening. Um, I could definitely say I had a little bit of that going on when I was making Old Boy's Apples. It took three years to make. and all my money and focus at the time. And for everyone that lived around me, uh, I was not a very fun person to be around. You ever meet the devil in any tangible way? I don't know if I've ever met the devil, which <laughs> uh, I, I guess you could say the devil in this old boy's apples isn't technically the, the Judeo. No, no. Yeah. Devil. Yeah. Devil. It's more of a, um, more of like a pagan not even pagan, more of like a, uh, I guess you would say it's, it's mostly influenced off of Celtic and early Indo-European mythologies of uh, the horned one or different nature spirits that involve those aspects. Um, but um, while I was making the film, I had these incredible dreams and this had never happened to me before. Um, where the characters were showing me how they moved. Hmm. 
because uh, I would I would have these things where I had this idea, you know, when you're doing animation, you draw your character, you draw the way they move, and you have this idea in your head of like, oh, this is who they are, and this is what they do. And then I built them, and I realized the armatures can't move the way that I want them to move. And I, I it was like really difficult for me at first. And I was like, wow, I'm really going to have to rethink all this. Like, I can't actually make what I want to make. And then I kind of just like, gave up in a for a period of time in a sense and was just like i'm just gonna try doing this and see what happens and then i started having these dreams where they were moving but they were moving in a way that wasn't how i thought they would move hmm. um and they would and, and it would oftentimes be the sequence i was working on and i would wake up the next day and take what i had dreamt about and go in and it would work out great and um that's honestly the kind of relationship I had with that film was every every choice I made where I was trying to control or do something, I ended up having to relinquish control to something else. And it always turned out better because of it. So by the end of it, I was just like riding a wave. I wasn't really consciously making decisions. Um, yeah, that's a fascinating process. I mean, I think it's always interesting to me. You can give, you know, even in Christianity, there's this idea sometimes you have to give up this like type of control over over life, and you should be, you should give it, you know, or you should like let it be in God's hands. But I often wonder if there's a way to relinquish that power unwittingly to like a different kind of spirit, you know. And I don't know what the art spirit is. I don't. I don't think it's necessarily the same thing. And I've made books that I look back on and I just go like, wow, I don't know what, I don't even know who made this, <laughs> you know, like, I don't even know what it means, what it's trying to say. It's often very dark. Um, and it often does hurt your life in some ways, in some tangible ways. Um, yeah. I think people don't, a lot of artists don't want to even confront that reality they'd rather live on the and i'm it sounds self-congratulatory but like there's ways of making that are far more on the surface and conscious and commodifiable and you can kind of guess like well if i hit this trend right and i draw this way then like i'll probably get more likes here and there um and i think that's a lot of art in the modernity but totally. when you submit it really is an act of submission to these spirits. Uh, yeah, I don't even know how to articulate it. It's interesting that your dreams, I never had that experience where dreams were kind of process suggestion or what, you know, like telling you this is what we need right now. Yeah. And it's what's even stranger is the dreams a hundred percent stopped the moment the film was like, not when I was completed with it, but when I stopped animating and I was done animating, it all went away. And I kind of felt like I had been dropped into the deep end again. And it was like, oh, you have to finish the rest of this now on your own. Like, we helped right. you out to this point. Um, and it took a while to, to figure out how to do it. But I remember at the time, I was really into um, Tarkovsky, um, the filmmaker, Russian filmmaker. Mm -hmm. um, and I was reading his, uh, I can't remember if it's his autobiography or if it's just like his book on, it's just basically goes over a lot of his filmmaking philosophy. And he kind of viewed himself more as a poet than he did a filmmaker. And I a hundred percent agree with him with the way that his movies are. They're a lot more poetic, I think, in their kind of absorption than they are, um, blockbusters. But, um, he had this concept that, when what, what, what you're trying to make as an artist is what you didn't have growing up. And by you being an, a true artist or a true poet, what you're doing is you're collectively taking that burden on for your society and you're making that thing that you didn't have growing up because odds are everyone else around you didn't have that thing either. The only thing is, is most of them don't have that's not their role in society to figure out what that thing is. They took a different path. You're sensitive to it as an artist, as a poet. 
So those signals, those things that you're getting, that's important. And that's your job as like part of the collective picture is to make this thing and bring it into the world so that people can have it. So in a sense, it's kind of like taking the role of a shaman, but yeah. in a very different way and in a much less individual or direct way and more in a collective kind of preaching sort of way or like the way a novelist does. Um, That's a strange okay. idea. Yeah, I just watched, I just screened the sacrifice at the art center I run. Oh, nice. And I, I had never seen that before. And then last night we watched Amor Kord, the Fellini film. And there's a similar kind of poetry in his work, very different aims. But um, I wonder what happens when so your society becomes illiterate to that uh, exorcism. You know, that's like part of my fear is that I think, you know, for a baby born today, I wonder if they'll know the difference between AI generated art and genuine human processed work by the time they're 18, you know, having grown up in it. And what does yeah. that mean? You know, like Steiner talks a lot about Iromonic possession, which is, I don't know if you know about Iromon, but I could be saying his name wrong. But he's like not Lucifer. He's often confused for Lucifer, but he's like a calcifying spirit that turns the almost people in the world to stone, and almost in like a literal sense. And it's he basically predicted it would emerge right around the time of the internet. And so it's not like the exuberant, you know, you can think of like the satanic impulse as more like this open, exuberant. Bacchus energy where it's just like drinking and drugs and it's open. It's very excited, almost like too much. And then Ironman is the complete opposite. It's just like this, you know, crushing surveillance force, this kind of, uh, well, you can feel it. I think it's like pretty easy to feel that power at play. Uh, this kind of calcification of individual progress and thought um yeah there's a concept in gnosticism too that's kind of similar uh or it's referred to as the black steel cage by a lot of people philip k dick wrote a lot about it mm -hmm. uh, more personal work ballas and the bad shit stuff that came out after that which i as crazy as it is i really enjoy reading it because he did a lot of research into those texts and um but yeah, there's this kind of idea that surveillance state is essentially like, yeah, like a archonic entity that is an, attempting to enslave free will and that it's something that humanity is kind of programmed to do. And mm -hmm. while we do it to nature, we do it to ourselves. And so ultimately it's like, it's one of those things you see in a lot of like animal rights stuff. Um, when you when you look into animal studies, you realize that almost all precursors to human uh, atrocities were tested out on animals before they were done on humans. And so uh, there's this kind of theory, and it's pretty much gone as says that if we're doing something to animals, we're going to be doing it to human beings in roughly twenty to thirty years after we do it to animals. I've never heard that. It's funny. Yeah, like chips in their brains controlling their action, literally. Or even traffic lights. You know, those were all tested out on farm animals. Like, how do you get people to <laughs> green is go, red is stop? Like, how do you make people feel like they have to keep moving, how they have to turn right here? And all these things were tested out on animals before they were put on to the human scale. <laughs> but... um. Yeah, so there's that kind of, I don't know, there's this, it's, there's a, there's a human being, that, uh, a type of human being that wants to control. And I think that's ultimately like something we'll all have to face with at some point, but I'm often given like a little bit of hope in the fact that like whenever people say like, oh, everybody's going to be doing this 
in in 20 years and i'm always kind of like well there's still amish people sure uh there's still like little groups that split off all the time and sometimes i wonder if maybe that's just going to be something that occurs more in the future and there's going to become you know different worlds essentially that humans live in um i think there will be it's only logical it's easier to organize along those lines as well yeah because i think if you try to force everyone to get on the same page um i mean you'll see what happens it's happened already several times um the chinese revolution is a great example <laughs> right, but, uh, right right yeah but so uh, re- when did old boy end uh i finished it at the very end of 2020 and i released it on the winter solstice of that year um, so part of uh, the ritual of the film and it being related to the calendar um, and moon cycles. But anyway, that's cool. Yeah, again, very Waldorf. Um, you know, to consider the seasonal shifts and these larger forces at play. Well, yeah, the film's meant to be a winter film. Um, and I designed it kind of based off of uh, several different winter mythologies and fairy tales and some folk tales as well that kind of have these similar symbols that play a part in them that are connected to some really old stuff um, that is kind of hidden in a lot of these communities. And like the, the further along you get with them and the more you read the deeper versions of these tales you start to realize that like oh these these stories aren't as simple as i thought they were there's layers of information that you receive at different points in your life um and if you're lucky enough to know people who are connected to it or have like lineage that really understand a deeper version of these stories you can learn all sorts of actual physical practical things that these stories are teaching as well um which often relate to farming or uh, cultivating foraging and survival in some way. For sure. But uh, are you just sitting around waiting for another possession? No, it already happened. Um, (laughs) I wrote the story and I was pitching it and um, it was going to be a feature length film. And basically all the people that were interested in it were like, we want to have you do a short before we have you jump into a feature, like a, 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 <laughs> essentially something that's a little bit more narrative than old boys apples a little bit longer, but isn't just full blown jumping into feature, which I get. Um, it's just too freaky to jump into. I think, yeah, there was like, the, there was some people that liked it. Apparently the studio that did the house on Netflix, um, the stop motion thing, they really liked it. And uh, I was fucking thrilled to hear that because I'm a huge Emma DeSwaff fan. Um, But they had just picked up a project that they're going to be working on, I guess, for like the next three years. So they were like, yeah, it's not great. Um, And yeah, a lot of people were like, this is really cool, but like you've you've made one film um, and this is weirder than your last film and it's longer and they liked it but they were like maybe you should do something that's like a little bit more conventional first to show people you can do that and then you get trust and uh and then maybe after that we'll try to do this next one so um would you try to um you said it took you three years right old boys yeah was it just you working on it uh, no. Uh, so for the most part, it was me, but uh, I had my partner at the time, Sammy. She started off doing fabrication with me. So she did all the felting work, all the needlework. And then she also taught me how to make miniatures, which was something that she was doing. And part of the reason I wanted to get into stop motion in the first place was I was just like getting a little burnt out on hand drawn animation and just like staring at a screen drawing all day. Sure. And she was doing all this cool stuff. And I was like, I want to learn how to do that. I, when we started making these little videos together, um, 
just for fun that we submitted into like our little group of friends, like local film festivals at the time. Um, and then we started making old boys apples. And at some point I lost my mind and it no longer became fun for her. Um, <laughs> and she was like, Hey, I'm going to, I, I really love you and I like this, but like, I don't want to work on this anymore. I'm happy to help you with it, but like, this isn't my project anymore. It's your project now. And I was like, I get it. Um, I think it happens a lot with animation. People are kind of like, when is this going to be done? And, sure. and you're like, well, it takes a very long time. And by the time it's done, you're not going to want to work on it anymore, but you have to finish it. And that's where a lot of people are like, yeah, I don't think I like animation that much. Or maybe they just don't like animating with me because maybe if I was a little more loose and fun and like willing to accept rough animation, I'd be able to make people happier. But unfortunately, I'm not fun when it comes to things looking a certain way. And I mean, there's shots in Old Boy's Apples where I animated them four times before I got it to look the way I wanted it to look. So, yeah, I mean, it all depends what you're making in the service of. I don't think art needs to be fun at all, but there's also the human part of it where, like, does a human need to enjoy what they do most of the time to keep doing it? Probably, unless they serve a higher being that is just like, you know, because I don't know, I was thinking about that the other day, the amount that people expect to be enjoying their life has increased a lot over time. And it's almost hard to imagine how much people accepted suffering as part of just like their moral duty, whether that was just like producing tons of kids or behaving correctly in the eyes of the God they believed in. And I think a lot of artists uh, unintentionally understand that suffering because somehow they're stay they're still connected to like this thing that is really demanding in a way that, jobs most jobs i don't think are yeah i mean i think a lot of people are able to go home at the end of the day and leave their work at home whereas if you're an artist and especially if you're an artist that's making your own work it's not going to go away when you go home it's going to be there with you uh every moment and that's kind of i don't know I'm, there are jobs, obviously, that are like that, but I don't know if it's the same kind of connection. I think there's yeah, a difference yeah. between having like a guilt over I'm letting other people down versus guilt of I'm letting my idea down. Sure. Which, which is kind of, I don't think a lot of people understand that. Um, but there are. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because then you're, you're contending with, I mean, it's part of the reason artists although it's often a bad idea, date other artists simply so they don't have to explain that kind of dynamic, which sounds insane to most people. But you know you, you got it bad when another artist is just like, all right, this is too much, I'm out. And that happens a lot, you know, because... That happened to uh, me. Yeah, you know, <laughs> you know I, think, I think rightly so. The partner is like in competition with the spirit or the idea and then i can only imagine what the gods think if they're just like this fucking guy oh, you know <laughs> like, what like is going on here well again like who knows and who knows what you're in service of yeah, it's, 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 it's it's very odd i would have a lot of moments like this while i was working on an old boy's apples where there would be a often like you care about this idea more than you care about our life Sure. And I would always be like, well, you're my muse. I'm making this for you. And there would be this kind of like, well, this isn't what I want you to make <laughs> for me. And I'd be like, well, you don't get to choose the gifts you get, do you? Um, That's tricky. The, the muse thing is, is really interesting and tricky. It is um, dangerous. Um, but yeah, it ultimately got to a point where I started shifting into her realm and I was about to abandon everything to become a homesteader after living on a farm for a year. And she was just kind of like, 
I started getting interested in making another film and then I started being like, oh, well, wait a minute, I can't do this. I'm just going to become a writer because I can't make films and be a farmer at the same time. So I'm just going to start writing these ideas, which I still do. I, I actually enjoy writing more than any of the other art that I do. But um, I think you put that, you put that out there or no? Uh, I'm planning to. Um, I'm, I'm planning to release a book of short stories and poems. Uh, hopefully before the end of this year. Um, and I'm going to use this little window of time that I have now uh, between applying for grants for my next film to like really bust this out and fine tune it and get it done. Um, so you were on the... That's what I would like to do someday is do more books. Um, but Like book books, not comic books, just books. Books, but with like uh, some fine art imagery in them. like you know, for chapter illustrations, you know, and some visual element, but then even some of them that are just more uh, writing. Um, but I like the idea of like making art books or like books that are kind of a mix of mediums and a mix of genre. Um, sure. And I don't know, I, I think there's also this element of like, writing is the newest for me. So I'm very much exploring and getting better at it as I'm working on it. And I've kind of just realized there's an endlessness to that. Um, and with stop motion, I kind of come in and out of it. I'll, I'll have moments where I'm like, I can, I fucking hate this medium. I'll never make another movie again. Like this is killing me. And then all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute, this thing comes out. And then I, I have to like start working on it and Thankfully, that's started happening within the last week or so with this new project. I was like really not feeling it for a while because um, I had to shift gears from that other film and start pitching a new one. And I was like, well, this isn't what the fucking spirit wants. Uh, how am I supposed to just tell this thing I've been working on for a year? Like, sorry, I'm going to have to put you in the back burner and work on this other thing. But um, it's it's finally waking up. And I'm enjoying being alone and doing nothing but working on this, which is great. Because um, oftentimes I'll have the itch for socialization, um, which is not happening right now. Maybe the rain has something to do with it. The rain? Yeah, it's been raining a ton here lately. Oh, yeah, I recall. I thought, I thought it was over. I thought it was over. It's still going. They keep telling us it's going to be over. And now I just, I don't believe the weather people anymore. And that's what they want you to believe. Yeah. But uh, so you were on the edge of domestication as a homesteader. And then you, you the old boy pulled you back in. Uh, Yeah. I mean, it was like an idea I had where I was with Sammy and I moved onto her mom's property in Pengrove, which is uh, next to Petaluma in Sonoma County and it's like beautiful farm. I was helping take care of ducks and chickens and Sammy was like full blown trying to turn this place into a real farm. But that was like her thing. And I was finishing old boys apples and then I finished old boys apples. And uh, basically I just dicked off for a year and wrote and played with ducks and chickens and like, yeah, I like I took care of them and like had to do some of the difficult farm jobs, like whenever an animal got injured and needed to be put down. That was my job, shit like that. Uh, but for the most part, I wasn't a real farmer and was not very good at doing farm work. And there was often criticism over that. <laughs> um, and yeah, I basically just got to a point where I realized I was like, yeah, actually, I'm not ready for this yet. And I'm, yeah, and it's kind of that selfish part of me that wanted to be like, I think I need to keep moving in this direction um, solely because of myself. And when you've been with someone for eight years, that's kind of, that's where you start getting into those conversations where you're like, okay, well, we love each other, but our paths are splitting. So do we want to do this for another eight years? And, or do you want to say, hey, this was cool. I get the idea of this. Maybe I could try something else. Um, right, right. Um, but yeah, it was good. Overall, it's been great, honestly, but um, difficult. So if the first chapter is football, 
Hawk. And the second is Animator. What do you think the third will be? I guess there's some chapters in between there, but I'm sure there's I'm sure there's many. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess you would say I went from trying to be an animator to now I think I'm more interested in being. I think fine art appeals to me more, and I think that kind of happened through stop motion. Because when you enter the stop motion world, you kind of you're no longer as much a part of the animation world. You're kind of viewed as like a. Mm. I think maybe a rougher animator, like you're a troll animator. Um, you bleed, your hands get dirty, you smell, and you work in the dark. Um, so there's that aspect of it. And so the animation community kind of like boxes you out a little bit, but then you're not quite artistic enough to be in the fine art community. And like when I was at part two gallery, uh, which you were at at one point too, uh, or when it was a different gallery, but I kind of often felt I was in between worlds. Like I'm a too nerdy for these artists and I'm too edgy for this animation community. Um, and I kind of still, I, I've always felt that way as a, you know, a football player turning into anime. I've never really fit in anywhere. So I've just kind of been like, okay, that's fine. And for the most part, people accept me for the weird and whatever the fuck I am. So I'm grateful for that. Uh, so yeah. yeah 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 i hear that story every time that's the story of being an artist you know what's hard is somehow we forget that you know you if you're an outcast you're an outcast the only way the outside world will connect you is if they seek to exploit you and i don't i don't mean to be cynical but in the sense of that i mean like the only way they can understand you is to use you for some functional end and maybe that's Maybe there's benefits to that, but I do think there are people who are just, I don't even know like how to describe it, but in a, if I get granola with it, vibrational, gravitational, magnetic or something, they just like see, they kind of always get pulled to the outside of the circle. Like mm -hmm. there's some, some weird resonance that just sends them out there and it becomes a real interesting challenge as to how to meet the world in a healthy way, socially speaking, because you can become resentful uh, for that. Or you can just become, you know, in their eyes, it's like um, a jester, something funny to ponder over or laugh about. Totally. I mean, I I've had often people tell me that they would prefer to view me through a screen than to interact with me in reality. Um, or I've had, I've had people tell me, somebody mentioned to me the other day that I said something. They said, this is extremely antisocial, like what you're saying right now. Uh, and like literally as I was talking, I was trying to make people uncomfortable um, by what I was saying. I think it had something to do with like, oh, I was talking about bonobo chimpanzees and how sure, their sure. mothers are the first one that introduced them to sex. And I was like, could you imagine if that's what it was like for human beings? And like literally within five seconds of me starting this conversation, six people left the room. Um, <laughs> yeah, those, those fuckers. <laughs> and I was just like, I, I get a real kick out of this. And maybe that is a little bit why. Oh, it's deserved. It's deserved. You know, there's no, there's no victim here. It's a, it's a deserved persona non grata. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's just a, whether or not you're going to enjoy the ride. It, it's like kind of like a little bit of, like the artist and the comedian. I think we, we often change shapes and interchange with each other. Cause sometimes the comedian is saying the right thing, but then every once in a while, the comedian says something that really upsets everyone else. But five years down the road, every, all of a sudden people realize like, holy shit, that was actually way ahead of its time. Or this person was talking about something that human beings like weren't ready to talk about while, yeah. you know, they were existing. And that is often, I think the, the case is like artists and musicians and poets and comedians, entertainers oftentimes are not afraid to talk about incredibly difficult things um and also with levity uh sure which 
I think makes a lot of people very uncomfortable because they're like, they get emotional, you know, you can see it like their, their, their vein starts popping in their throat or their heart rate goes up when you're talking about a certain thing. And we're used to dancing in the dark. So it's not scaring us the same way as someone who's opening up this door for the first time. And it's, not in a safe place it's like at a party or in public you know and they're just like wait a minute i don't want to be thinking about this right now Um, yeah i mean i won't go down the whole kaczynski uh, kaczynski over socialization i don't know if you ever read the unabomber's manifesto but the way he talks about over socialization is really interesting to me and you're talking about the opposite but I think a lot of humans, right, a lot of people right now in America are over socialized and they have this like over sensitivity about, you know, just talking about bonobos fucking. Yeah, exactly. It's, it, too. Yeah. So there's like, it's easy to, you know, 10 years ago, I didn't, I used to think there was no edge left to art. Suddenly there's plenty of edge. You know, in terms of like what could get you in trouble or just end your career, it didn't feel like there was anything back even a decade. Just almost felt boringly open. Um, so I've been enjoying that. It sounds like you have been too. Uh, yeah, there's there's something nice about feeling like you're doing something that could potentially ruffle some feathers, um, but you're doing it for the right reason or you believe in it. So it's fine. And I, I true, truly, truly believe that in 40 years, people are going to look at this time period and just be like, what the fuck were people doing? Or maybe it'll be worse. I don't know. But I have a feeling I, I, people are always like, we're headed in this trajectory. We're doing this. I don't believe that. I think there's ebbs and flows and there's periods. And, you know, we could be right around the corner from another 60s style Renaissance hippie movement type thing that is beyond our perception um yeah i think it's coming you know like as a self-identified dark hippie i sense it i I can feel feel it it. i mean we're at the age now where the keys are getting tossed over to us pretty soon and what's kind of when when this whole generation of people that kind of watched these various movements happen and were basically kind of squashed by power structures and that all of a sudden we're given the keys. Are we going to like keep letting the system go on the way it is? Or are we going to, you know, start using the education system and young people to do something different. And often, you know, that's the job of us, the old artists. We we're the ones that have to start making shit that excites the young people. Um, Cause they actually do physical things. We don't. Wow, I, I never think of that as a goal. That's interesting. Also, there's. I don't. There's, it, but <laughs> I, don't I don't. I don't give a flying fuck about. I'm interested in the opinion of dead people, not of twenty year olds. Um, but there is no we. That's always been the problem, you know. Like there's, there's, like I said, it always feels to me like there's. If there is a we. It's controlled by many forces above with different aims, different goals, and they possess different contingencies, different mobs at different times. And for whatever reason, they need to express themselves just the same as us. Um, but I ask, I usually ask for a joke, but I'm going to ask for, to end the, pod, the podcast, the best story you have about football your best football story as a player of football. Ooh. Legs popping out, you know, something, something. I could tell you a fun one. Well, I got, hmm, what's the best? Go ahead. You got, you got got time. You can do two. All right. (laughs) One of them was, um, when I, had my moment of realizing that there's levels of athletes and uh, (laughs) there was this guy who ended up playing for the 49ers that I played against. His name was Anthony Moyaki. Uh, He is a tight end. 
And his dad was a security guard at our school, but he went to a school that was like a few towns away in Naperville. Um, and he was like, just fucking massive. And I remember I was a sophomore and I got moved up to varsity and I was playing against him and he was the first person I ever tried to like hit and tackle and it did nothing. Um, and I just was like, holy shit. Uh, Cause I was used to being the big guy all the time. Uh, and so I hit this guy and literally just like, he just shed through me. Like I was like a piece of toilet paper and I grabbed his ankles <laughs> and just like held on as he dragged me. Uh, and like the rest of the team joined in and, and helped me take him down. But, uh, <laughs> He's like a golem, just like a yeah. stone man. Yeah, there is something cool. Whatever those, um, you can encounter that when you meet artists who are better. Um, but it isn't quite the same physical implication. But just that feeling of like, oh, that cycle of yeah, being at the top and then being dropped to the bottom. And in a crude sense, I guess it happens in like four years of schooling, that kind of high school to college. You think you're hot shit, then you get dropped right back down. But I think that happens if you're on the right path in art all the time. But I like that story. It's a good visual. I don't know who the hell that tight end is, and I watch a lot of football, but you know, he probably he probably sucked. I, he he was good for a little bit. I don't know if he's in anymore, or if he's like backup, but he he did pretty good when he first came out. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah. I mean, I just this is a different different sport, different story, but, uh, I used to wrestle as well and do mixed martial arts. And mm -hmm. I, I quit wrestling because I had been doing it for so long. I think I started when I was six or seven years old. Um, I went three years undefeated before high school and I got to a point where I was like entering high school and I got moved up to varsity as a freshman. I beat the guy in my weight class, like immediately. And then I got put on varsity and basically they had me wrestling like grown men. Um, and I was a freshman. So I ended up getting my ass kicked a lot by these other schools that had better teams because our team just kind of sucked. Um, and so I had this one where the, the, basically the, I had a, an even match with this guy. We, neither of us were very technically good enough to like knock the other person down. And we were also pretty much evenly strength. And he was also moved up. He was a freshman too. So we were these two <laughs> like jacked freshmen that were somehow moved on to varsity that were going against each other. And I found out afterwards that he was as scared as I was. Um, of course. Just full interaction. Like, and we both did the same thing where we drank uh, a, a Red Bull before the match to like get the edge. And it literally just ended up being a thing where there was no technique. There was no skill. We just grappled for the whole time. Like, and the match went almost to the very end and our bodies were completely covered in bruises by the end of it. Like we were both purple from just like trying to, force the other person to not move on their back. Um, and I ended up pinning him. <laughs> and uh, I remember I saw him years later when we were playing football together. And he, I was, I was playing and he basically like checked me out of nowhere and like knocked me on my ass and then came up and like gave me a hand and helped me up. And I recognized him. And he was like, I finally got you back. <laughs> I was just like, what are you just like? Fucking, yeah, Top Gun or something. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But you get a lot of those moments in sports because I think that's kind of just what happens when, when you're a sports guy. There's a lot of that, those like simple moments where you don't really have to overthink it too much. Yeah. It's like, this is just guys being guys, you know? Uh, very, very romantic. No, I, I I still play sports a lot, and I I completely understand that that 
I don't know what you call it, but it's special. It's a special feeling you can't get anywhere else. Yeah. You know, it's and awesome. you don't you don't get in art, you it's just different. Like you can fool yourself in art a lot. You know, you could say, ah, that giant stone man I just tried to tackle. That you know, obviously it's a metaphor, but like, yeah. you know, ah, that's actually I wasn't trying to make uh that scene look like this. I was actually trying to make it look like that. And you can kind of, if you're not honest with yourself, you can skirt around those embarrassments. But in sports, it's just like, Jesus. It's just, you can't avoid it. That's why I just, whenever I don't play enough sports, I miss that because I don't get that from art. Totally. It's one of those things where I think I, I rejected sports for so long after I got out of it. And uh, it's like the same, you know, you mentioned you were raised Catholic. I was raised Catholic. I had the same thing with that, too. I hated Catholicism growing up. And I hated sports after I quit playing them because I was forced to play them for so long. But now I've had this, like, time and space to try to do my own thing. And there's so much that I've learned to love and kind of miss about those things. Um, like, yeah, I'm same. Catholic art now, which I used to hate growing up, but like my favorite painter is Bosch and um, Bruegel the Younger. And so, or Bruegel the Elder. Um, yeah, fuck the Younger. Yeah, I don't know what happened with him. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, you know, there's like the, the same thing has happened with sports where now all of a sudden I like, I really enjoy kind of being around that kind of light, simple fun energy and kind of just realizing the value of it. It's like, Oh, this is like a way for people that don't know each other to have something to communicate with while they're in passing. Um, oh yeah. It is strangely very intimate. The, the moments of sports, maybe, maybe like, I don't know. There's like a poetry to it that maybe is not seen by everyone who plays, but I think it's pretty clear. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, honestly, sometimes I, I kind of regret when I'm in a bar and some guy sits down next to me and starts talking to me about football. And I'm just like, I just have to pretend like I still know what's going on. And sometimes I kind of wish that I had the time or like the patience to like actually look into it. But oh, that's very valuable to me, you know, being able to speak to like other contractors as people and as, you know, compatriots you know like there's there's a like art school trains you to be just like really look down upon normal people i think often and it's not i don't know if it's intentional but i feel like people emerge with this view that like those people aren't worth making art for and uh that's bullshit yeah i i agree it's bullshit and yeah, I, I often run into the situation where, like, I'm really good at communicating with most people that are kind of not artists, and I can get along with them, but then there's always a point where they realize what I do, and then they start asking me questions, and then they realize, like, oh, you're fucking a lot weirder than I thought you were, and I'm like, yeah, I know, I'm sorry, like, I, I'm trying to keep it together here at work, but... Um, <laughs> But yeah, it's often like older guys when they're just like, what do you do in your free time? Like you, what, what sports are you into? Like, what do you watch? And I'm like, oh, I write poems and play with puppets in my free time. And then they're like, oh. <laughs> yeah, yeah. every once in a while you, you meet a guy that's like, bro, I wish I did that. Oh yeah. Those guys are great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I always say like, just let it be, keep it as a fantasy. Some things are best kept as a fantasy. If you don't need to go down this path, just just don't you know yeah don't torture yourself enjoy the simple life you know go to the game scream I need to check out some of uh your work i i have some of these old comics and darker things you've mentioned i would love to dive into the depths of your darker side that sounds fun oh yeah i'll send you send me your mailing address i'll send them over it's you know I made them a while ago, but uh, I will do that. And uh, I got to go to bed. I'm an old, I'm an old boy. What time so is it? that's not even ten, but it's approaching ten as it as it must. That's appropriate. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, good talking to you. And I hope that you can be the hawk. And whatever that may be. I hope so too. I mean, honestly, I, I, I've kind of always wanted to get to a point where, cause I've had so many people help me out in my life, especially as an artist. I've, and when you're a fine artist and independent artist, you often end on, end up taking more than you give from sure. the people that are seeing something in what you're doing. And truthfully, I just want to get to a point someday where I can be at a, a healthy enough relationship with my work and monetary success where I can give to other people and make a kind of unique environment that is more related to practice and kind of um, connecting spiritually and maybe not necessarily spiritually if that's not your thing, but just connecting with the work in a way that is taken a little bit more seriously and not just viewed as like, this is our day job. Um, yeah, no, I guess you. But um, who knows? We'll see. Just got to keep keep on keeping on. Hope that these French grants pick up. And uh, yeah, my next film will hopefully be How to Bake a Bread Boy. That's the name of it? Yep. <laughs> All right. Well, good talking to you. You as well, man. This was a lot of fun. Um, thanks for having me on. For sure. I'll send you some books. Please do. I'm excited to... I mean, honestly, I'm a huge fan of your drawings. Um, the grittiness and the roughness of them. It, it's the kind of stuff I get excited drawing. So I think there's very much a sympathetic kind of appreciation there somewhere. Well, I go in phases. Um, kind of schizoid phases of, oh, that's too clean, get dirty. But I tend to be whatever I am kind of simple in that way so if it's dirty it's dirty if it's clean it's clean um but i don't know what people think i make or do as i've been a little under the radar for like four years so i'm not sure what you've seen or heard but uh <laughs> i'll send you the books and you'll get a sense of it hell yeah that sounds great um yeah, and I, I'll keep in touch with what you're doing. I'm hoping to come out to your space at some point. I'll let you know when I'm on the East Coast. and Sure. I swing by and check out the theater. That would be super cool. Oh, yeah. I'm sure we'll have something going on. That's, uh, yeah, if you're ever in New Jersey, just let me know. Will do. All right. All righty. Good night, Michael. Good night. That may be a classic. Music by Dory Bavarsky and Ming Chen. Next up, we have Eleanor Machalka. See you then.